It's a pleasure to be here. I've heard you've had a wonderful day so far. Hopefully uh, I can keep you uh, attentive for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. But um, like Fred said, uh, I don't have a scientific background. In fact, uh, for me, coming to work at Ansto sort of at a mature age of life, it's been a, a bit of a renaissance of learning a whole lot of science that I wasn't really that interested in when I was at school. For some reason, I was more interested in stuff happening at the back of the classroom, uh, just trying to look like the biggest idiot possible. So um, a lot of science uh, went past me and it has been so refreshing, it's been so uh, just surprising to start working for a scientific organisation, I've been there for 10 years now, to learn new science, new exciting, um, incredible science on a daily basis and to work with about uh, 400 scientists that are all very incredible in their own way. So in a lot of ways, I see myself almost a, a bit of a spokesperson for all those scientists that uh, work for ANSTO. Some of them can't really come out and talk about their science in a very meaningful manner. And uh, you know, the ones that can, they need as much support to try and get it, the message out to as many people as possible. So like Fred mentioned, uh, I uh, have a, a bit of a background, uh, corporates, uh, so National Australia Bank, Optus, and I'm really feeling like I dodged a bullet, <laughs> that I'm still not working there today. Um, clubs New South Wales, so defending uh, the pokey industry to some degree. Even uh, major events like the World Masters Games where you had to make 60-year-olds uh, that are performing sport look sexy. So uh, a lot of my uh, background is uh, misunderstood brands. So um, nuclear science kind of fits into the category. Some people might say it's even the Mount Everest. Uh, but um, it, uh, for those of you that haven't been to Anso before, and I know there's a lot of people that have, it is uh, you know just a very, very positive untold story. So that uh, makes that part of it interesting. I will ask who has been to Anso before? A whole chunk of you. I'm going to ask uh, the lady down the end then. So uh, Ken, we'll, we'll play a game. It's the afternoon session. Word association, so the word of the day, nuclear. I'm going to say it. first word that comes to your mind. Future. Yeah, future. future. Oh, wow, okay. Anyone can play this game? First thing that comes to mind, please? Atom. Atom. Okay, good, thank you. Energy. Energy, yes, okay. Positive proton. Positive proton, yeah, okay. Cancer, Cancer treatment. Anyone want to like, be the devil's advocate? Controversial in what way? Uh, in, uh, with the oh, with the greenies, okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> Music to my ears. Okay, so there's a wide range there that you can see that there's lots of applications. No one said bombs, no one said disasters. So, I mean, you know, very unusual sample size this big, that someone wouldn't say that type of thing. Uh, yeah, it has its baggage, absolutely. But um, no, for us at Ansto, like I said, uh, a very, very positive story to tell. So we've got around about 1,300 people that uh, work in our Sydney campus. We also operate a uh, large particle accelerator, the Australian Synchrotron down in Melbourne. Uh, if you ever get a chance to check that out, uh, that is an amazing facility. Um, and uh, we support about 6,000 users coming in to use our scientific infrastructure on an annual basis. Been doing this for around about 70 years and very much interested down at the atomic scale. So, uh, you know, trying to understand uh, atomic structures, how I might be able to um, change what is happening in the atom that could have some sort of a benefit on the end result of what you're looking at. And of course, a lot of the stuff that we are looking at incredibly small uh, so small you're not going to see it with the most powerful electron microscopes. You've got to come down and use things like neutron scattering patterns to understand what's happening at that atomic structure. So um, when I say, you know, some large infrastructure, we obviously have Australia's only nuclear reactor called Opal, which is making nuclear medicines like uh, molybdenum, it haze into technetium. So on average, we're all going to need this medicine at some stage of our life. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the Centre for Neutron Scattering so we can understand atomic structure. So if I can um, understand that structure and its behaviour under certain conditions, I might be able to change that structure. I might be able to have an impact on the end properties of what I'm looking at. So essentially, everything's made up of atoms. I get a chance to look at that structure. I might be able to make that thing that I'm looking at bigger, better, faster, stronger. 
we have the synchrotron down there, so a very large particle accelerator, 216 metres round, speeding up electrons to 99.999987% of the speed of light. I think I got that right. Uh, so a fractionally slower than uh, the Large Hadron Collider. We like to send our uh, electrons in one direction. Um, that's not <laughs> a reference to a pop group, by the way. Uh, whereas, you know, the collider is smashing them together. And when you speed around these electrons, you are creating a high intensity photon. So light that's about a million times brighter than the sun. Shine that on an object and it's another way of seeing atomic structure. We also have a bunch of particle accelerators at Lucas Heights as well too. I know most of you, half of you have been to ANSTO before, so I am just going to cover off a little bit more. Ten minutes or so on some of this infrastructure. This is uh, a bit of a flyover of the Opal Research Reactor. So um, it does exactly what the name suggests, research. Um, it uh, allows us to produce the majority of the country's nuclear medicines. It's not uh, producing energy has no credible scenario of blowing up. So uh, unlike, you know, our uh, generation one power reactor, has a small amount of uranium, so about eight kilograms of uranium-235 in the core, which is this square in the middle of the screen here, which sits inside an enclosed tank at the bottom of a 14 meter pool. Inside that enclosed tank, you're splitting apart uranium-235. You're creating lighter isotopes, which could be a nuclear medicine. But you're also releasing excess neutrons that are in the nucleus of the uranium-235. So if I start the process with one neutron going in, you're generally going to get three coming out of the other side of the uh, core of the reactor. This whole enclosed tank is called a reflector vessel, so it reflects around neutrons. So if I've got three that are coming out the other side, they're eventually going to get reflected back into the core. It's going to find more uranium-235, and I am going to create even more neutrons. And that whole process works exponentially. So I eventually hold up an imaginary sugar cube here. I've got billions and billions of neutrons in the size of that sugar cube. So most of those neutrons we are then sending into our centre for neutron scattering for a whole range of research purposes. This is kind of giving you just a little bit of an indication of starting to produce a nuclear medicine. So we have uranium in the core of our reactor, but we also irradiate strips of uranium-235. Think about a metal ruler, a little bit shorter than that, and they sit inside this canister. They will sit there and get bombarded by the neutrons that are created in the core of the reactor, and these strips of uranium-235 will break up into lighter isotopes. Come back out of the reactor, can take 10 days, even a little bit longer. They look exactly the same, uh, but uh, these are now target plates, we call them, or strips of uranium that so we can then go and process to get isotopes out of them and technetium-99 is how we make this. Technetium-99, um, a radioisotope that is used about uh, 700,000 patient doses uh, a year. Um, so this is a very important diagnostic tool. Um, it's in the Goldilocks zone in terms of isotopes. So we can put this into a patient. Um, we can get a very faint gamma ray that creates an image through a drum scanner we can have that nice and close uh, to a disease like a cancer. We can start to characterise things like a cancer cell wall. So the specialist is going to get the right information to actually treat a patient afterwards. Um, so very important in that sense, but it's also got a very short half-life, six hours. Um, so this is something you get today, it's out of your system tomorrow. But it's also a decay product, technetium of an isotope that's produced in those strips of uranium called molybdenum-99. Molybdenum has a 66-hour half-life, so we produce that, we put it into a special drum, which we then send out to 250 hospitals each fortnight. That molybdenum will decay in the drum, so it gives us enough time to get it around the country and get it into patients, but there's a way of only getting technetium out of the drum, leaving the molybdenum behind. So uh, very intricate uh, sort of operation in that sense and is very widely used around the world because of those characteristics. In our reactor too, we're also a world leader in irradiating silicon ingots. 
So uh, think about a can of soup, around about uh, that size. We receive these silicon ingots. They come from customers from all around the world. Um, you know, if they make these silicon ingots as a single crystal of silicon, which we wish we knew how they did it, but it's uh, a very elaborate way of growing a crystal structure into an ingot. Um, and uh, they send them to us. Uh, we then irradiate them in our reactor. We change the properties of the silicon. So silicon, a non-conductive uh, material naturally, but uh, you can bombard uh, a certain isotope in these silicon ingots, silicon 30. It's about 3% of all the silicon in the ingot. It will get a bit fed up being bombarded uh, by the neutrons and will accept a neutron into its nucleus, turn itself from silicon 30 into silicon 31, which makes it slightly radioactive, goes through a decay chain, it ends up being an isotope of phosphorus. This takes about a day or so. Phosphorus, a conductive material, even though it's a very small percent that are in these silicon ingots, we can then turn silicon from a non-conductive into a semiconductive material. And you can do this a number of ways. Um, so uh, silicon uh, mutation or irradiation uh, doesn't necessarily have to be done into a reactor, but if you want to put your silicon into a high en uh, energy use, it's the best way of doing it. So, so we irradiate about 50% of the world's silicon ingots in our reactor, uh, so very much a world leader in this sense. It's around about uh, 80 tonnes of silicon a year that we're irradiating. And we know our silicon are going into these uh, types of renewable applications or new technologies uh, that the world needs into the future. So I mentioned we're making the neutrons in the bottom of our reactor. They go into our, one of our key research facilities, our Centre for Neutron Scattering. So um, can't see it all that well in this picture, but we have beam lights. So there's a little bit of green box in, which indicates two of the beam lights. We've got a third one over here, excuse me, with a couple of large cylinder type tanks at the end. <coughs> So we have 15 instruments that will all tell our scientists something a little bit different about the atomic structure or how a structure will behave under certain conditions. Most of them named after Australian uh, native animals, as this is a key international facility. So around about 1,000 international scientists coming to use our facilities each year. Very important that, uh, you know, not only ANSTO scientists, but a whole bunch of Australian university students are then collaborating with these international scientists. Uh, so hence the name that we do have most of our instruments. It's a marketing ploy to, uh, you know, you could be sitting there in dreary old England, you've had Brexit, the Queen's died, you're dreaming of coming to Australia to use, I don't know, Wombat, the most powerful powder defractometer in the world that could be your researcher's dream. So uh, that kind of plays into the marketing bit about it. Saying all that, we have a couple of instruments that aren't Aussies. So SPATS is a German instrument that uh, we have been donated. Uh, and that's because after Fukushima, the German government said that we're out of nuclear full stop. So not just energy, but also research. So uh, our equivalent research agency in Germany is pretty much been split up now. Um, and instruments being sent around to other facilities. We also have here SICA, which is a Taiwanese deer, so uh, around about a $12 million instrument, so that it was an investment of the Taiwanese government. So their researchers not only get access to that instrument, but the other instruments that are in our Centre for Neutron Scattering. You can use these instruments for practically most types of research, um, but this is just a little bit of a, uh, an example. Lots of sort of hydrogen and battery work. So this neutron scattering technique, very good for the lighter elements of the periodic table. Uh, in particular, you can use the neutrons uh, to see through things. So uh, consider a neutron a very powerful X-ray. It's going to see through it most items. Um, so it allows you to understand uh, structures that you might not want to break open. So, uh, for example, we've just finished a uh, partnership with the Powerhouse Museum, uh, so they had an exhibition called uh, Invisible Revealed. They gave us 26 of their items that uh, they kind of had a backstory to, but they never quite really knew what materials were in these things or how they worked. So we use the neutrons uh, and the synchrotron um, and some of our other facilities to find more information for them. I think we've actually given them more questions than answers, but that's fine. 
that's exactly what science is all about. You can bounce off the neutrons uh, on surfaces, uh, so you know, lots of neutron research, your know, mobile phone, um, trying to get those electrons to go through your layers of your surface, or to make your solar panels more efficient. Magnetism is quite an important thing as well too, so the neutrons have a spin. You can change their spin with magnetism, so essentially you can set up a zero and a one combination, so you can start looking at quantum applications, because you're talking about a neutron that's incredibly small. Um, so lots in that space through to memories on thin films, uh, even like changing the neutrons of certain compounds that uh, could be in a brain tumour to kill it as a, a way, a non-invasive way of killing a brain tumour. The synchrotron. So this is just going around the 217 metre ring. Um, and if anyone's in Melbourne on the 16th of October, we have an open day at the Synchrotron. I don't think it will be, but so, uh, you know, this is a, a great opportunity. We get about uh, 3,000 people coming into the facility. We've got uh, around about 80 scientists that are all waiting to answer questions from the general public of the Synchrotron. So I kind of explained how the Synchrotron works before. Again, it's got a wide range of applications. When we were all locked down in 2020 and 21, the synchrotron was still working, and that was because they did around about 120 experiments characterising COVID uh, viruses and vaccines. Uh, so it was one of these critical infrastructures that kept on operating uh, throughout COVID. Uh, things like you can use that synchrotron light, that high intensity light to, to see hidden images behind paintings. Um, uh, you can... Uh, you know, start to understand different uh, compounds on planets. Uh, so, you know, lots of uh, space there. And, uh, you know, agricultural, food, environmental, a wide range of applications. This is one painting, a Degas. So just to give you a little bit of uh, a reveal, um, an unusual situation where an artist has, I'll say, I don't want to offend anyone here, has an old, older woman as the finished product. Started off with something a little bit different though. I don't know if you can see this starting to come through. You might see a nose here. So Degas actually had a younger lady, but decided to paint over her. He did paint her another time, a totally different painting. I'm not quite sure who the lady was, but so uh, you know, Let's just speculate. They had some history. <laughs> so, uh, you know, lots of that type of work. So across the whole range, uh, nuclear techniques, those different types of instruments, great for the environment. So understanding different isotopes that are in the environment, how things move through the environment, so tracing pathways uh, through to dating things that are in the environment as well too. So some of our um, sort of flagship environmental programs is that we have the longest running air quality program in the world. So, so it's been in the Sydney Basin for 32 years. Looking at uh, the 2.5 micron types of uh, elements that get into you know, our lungs and very hard to get back out. Um, looking at uh, you know, the impacts of like, industry on air quality. So um, we could tell, not that this is still the case, that there were certain emissions coming out of factories in Newcastle that uh, weren't uh, you know, complying with regulations. Um, you, know, you can see all sorts of interesting things when there's a bushfire event. Um, you know, way, way back when we started this, it was all about looking at what was in leaded petrol and helping to get uh, you know, the transition through to unleaded petrol. We also have a lot of expertise in water ecosystems as well too, using isotopes to understand underground water how water systems recharge naturally, how long that water's been in there using isotopes like chlorine 36 and carbon 14. So been to 500 locations looking at small communities. These are kind of regional remote places, places that are above the Great Artesian Basin, don't necessarily have natural river systems, so they're relying on their underground water and giving them, you know, sustainability type assessments of how they are using that critical resource in that part of Australia. Also lots of expertise in the nuclear fuel cycle, so we're part of international collaborations. Uh, so the 
power industry um, is starting to build new reactors, we can call them Gen 4 reactors, um, which there's a range of them out in the marketplace. Uh, you've probably heard of small modular reactors. They are a Gen 4 reactor. They're about a quarter of the size of a traditional power reactor, um, less than a quarter of the cost generally as well too, and uh, being heavily looked at in a number of developing countries, so the UK, um, have announced that they will be installing 12 small modular reactors as well as two uh, more traditional large-scale reactors as well too. And we help looking at componentry that go into these new Gen 4 reactors, um, look at different types of ways of dealing with the byproducts, the spent fuel as well too. And of course we have health as well too. So uh, aside from like making uh, some nuclear medicines, I mentioned uh, technician for diagnostic, um, but there's a number of isotopes there that are treatments uh, for various cancers, thyroid cancers, brain tumors, um, prostate cancers, renal systems, uh, bone cancers, um, through to doing research and new skin cancer um, techniques and uh, advanced breast cancer breast cancers as well too. So there's not just producing, but a lot of research in these types of areas. Um, one isotope in particular, Letitium-177, is uh, an isotope that we brought into the country. Um, so Germany was using it for some brain tumours, and we have that available for Australian patients as well too. It's got a little bit more of a stronger gamma radiation to it. It's quite good for advanced prostate cancers. Uh, so we've been working with the Peter McCallum Clinic um, and gone through a couple of clinical trials. The first clinical trial had 30 patients that uh, had advanced prostate cancer, so less than a year to live, they'd already had other types of therapies that weren't so uh, successful. And of those uh, 30, we had 15 um, fully cured and 15 with their cancer rem uh, uh, remission. So Letitium 177 went on to a clinical trial of 200 patients, which similar results, it's now in its third and final and also available, you know, to, but not quite um, at the price that we would like it to be. So, you know, once it goes through the last clinical trial, it become more readily available. And this is just a snapshot of some of the different types of isotopes that uh, we are looking at uh, for a whole range of different cancers into the future. So that's a little bit about ANSTO. Um, I guess in terms of trends in STEM careers, Probably no breaking news here, but uh, you know, uh, like Ansto, uh, STEM careers has a little bit of a marketing issue as well. So um, you, know, you go and talk to enough year nine students, how many of them want to be scientists? What do they think science is all about? Do they think it is necessarily going to be a researcher? Because you go and study science these days, it's unlikely you will become a researcher. Um, they don't quite understand the importance of STEM, what it is going to lead to into the future, why they really should be across it. So, so we do have um, a bit of a perceptual problem. But to put it into scientific terms, we've got to turn to this dude here um, who said reality is an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. I'm not sure if that quite makes sense to me. I just wanted to put Albert Einstein up on the screen for you. So, we surveyed our 400 scientists and engineers, uh, this is uh, a few years ago now, um, and asked them why they like being a scientist. And uh, these are their top five reasons. The top one, hands up if you think it's A. Okay. B, hands up anyone, does anyone have hands that move? Yeah, C, C. See, okay, thank you, good. D? Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Fred's a very good collaborator, so I can imagine him saying D. Uh, and E? Yeah, they're all very important reasons. C was the number one. But I can guarantee you that most kids out there, they don't really think about the, the power of, this is, you know, being a researcher uh, to, you know, actually discover something. It's, if you become a researcher, you are going to, it's highly likely you're going to discover something that no one else has discovered before. It's gonna take a while, it's gonna be a lot of hard work and effort, but you know, 
this is what you will do. You will make your mark on the world. You will improve people's lives. You will have an opportunity. Most people think that, most kids think that you're going to be stuck by yourself, probably in a very dark cellar, uh, you know, working away, maybe a candle, lighting your papers. Uh, this is the vision that people have of being a, a researcher, and it's nothing like that. It is highly collaborative. In fact, unless you are collaborating with like-minded people all around the world, you probably aren't uh, doing the level of science that uh, you should be these days. And I think this is really important. So it's one of those lessons that you probably learn when you get a little bit older in life. But, you know, people are telling you what to do all the time. Um, and it's kind of nice if you can find something where you get to decide yourself what you do to a degree. I mean, researchers still have to get bossed around a bit. But these are very, very uh, important reasons. We all know that, you know, there's decline in the number of uh, students studying uh, HSC sciences, and that uh, most students just cannot picture themselves as a scientist. So I think we need to change the narrative a little bit um, and talk about, you know, well, what studying science will lead to into the future. There are all of these growing industries. Like I said before, it's unlikely that you're going to go through, do a degree, become a researcher, and that's going to be your lifelong career these days. So there are all of these other professions that are starting to say, I want STEM qualified students, and if they aren't saying it yet, they will be more and more into the future. Um, I think these numbers are fairly conservative. I've just pulled them out of government reports for whatever, but uh, uh, let's say 3,000 jobs in hydrogen, I, th I think is undercooked a little bit. So 30,000 jobs in space, you know, well, we could be on track for that. So regardless, um, the, the trends are that uh, there are going to be more and more industries and organisations that are looking for STEM qualified people into the future. And these are more broader sectors than starting to look at uh, certain industries as well too. So interestingly, you know, we get a lot of visitors out to Ansto. Um, and part of my role is uh, I usually have some involvement in most of the visits. Uh, so we get a lot of industry, we get a lot of consultants, you know, PwC, uh, KPMG, these types of organisations are employing more and more STEM qualified people to become consultants so they are actually staying up with STEM so that they can then consult out to other organisations to stay up with STEM. So we know that uh, the number of students participating in STEM are declining but we know that uh, the increase um, uh, I guess requirements of the workforce are increasing. So what uh, we are looking at here is, you know, certain critical STEM skills that are required into the future. And my summary of this is uh, STEM skills, so the ability to teach